Back in the 70s, board games and improv theater had a baby. And it was called the role-playing game. These games allowed a generation of kids to live out their dreams of slaying dragons and saving kingdoms, all while sitting in their bedrooms and basements. Today, gaming has moved into the cultural mainstream, and role-playing games are back with a vengeance. Join us now as five of these former kids come out of the basement and onto the internet to experience adventure, mystery, and obscure pop culture references. It's time for Roll for Combat! Hey everyone, welcome to Roll for Combat. I'm your GM and host, Steaming Liquor, and in this week's show... The boys finally leave for the jungle. Also this week, I have a special guest. I have an interview with the Order of the Amber Die, And we finally give you instructions on how to enter the trip to PaizoCon. So this week's show is so big that I'm not having a GM tip. I was going to, but then I realized the show might be three hours. So forget that. So instead, I have a whole bunch of things. First of all, I have an interview with the Order of the Amber Die. There's actually such a large interview that I'm breaking it up into two parts. This week is part one. And for those who don't know who the Order of the Amber Die is, I would suggest you check out their Facebook page, or better yet, go to the Paizo blog, and you can look them up there. They write up a whole bunch of information about what they do, and they have pictures. But long story short is they play Pathfinder, and they play it like three or four days in a row. They basically get together, they play four days in a row, they barely eat, they barely sleep, they are hardcore Pathfinder players. They play the Pathfinder Adventure Paths. And I had the opportunity to go to their secret lair in New Jersey and hang out with them, and it was awesome. As for instructions on how to enter the PaizoCon contest, I have the information. There is a form for you to enter. If you want, you can go right now. Go to paizocon.rollforcombat.com, simply fill out that form in full, and you will be entered into the contest. There will be a drawing, it will be in two weeks. So on the episode on May 1st, I will be announcing the winner. You can check out the website, paizocon.rollforcombat.com, for all the rules and information, and how to enter. I will warn you, there is one more question that relates to this show that you will need to answer. So make sure you listen to the show so that you can answer it. Also, finally, I want to mention that we did record our Starfinder Society podcast, and we are releasing a preview of it if you follow us on Patreon. I'm going to release the first part of it early. It's not going to be released on this podcast for another week or two, so if you really can't wait, you can check it out. It has, again, it has the same people from Roll for Combat, plus friends of the show, Rob Tremarco and Jason Keeley from Paizo. They are awesome. And the best part about it is whenever I have a question about Starfinder, I can just ask Jason Keeley, because he always knows. It's awesome. You should always get someone from Paizo to play games with you. It makes it way more convenient when you're arguing rules. So with that, let's get into the show. So after you got some credits, you guys went on your Pretty Woman shopping spree. You went to the high-end district in Quarbarth. You find the prettiest dresses, the best perfumes, the most glamorous armor. And what did you guys end up buying? We bought a lot of stuff. John Stats is playing the Vesk soldier, Mo Dupinski. Uh, looking at the notes that we got in the last... Uh, a couple episodes ago, we got uh, some antitoxins. Uh, we think that the jungles are going to be uh, uh, pretty grim. Uh, our big purchase was the uh, advanced med kit. Uh, that lowers our uh, uh, difficulty uh, uh, by five. So instead of ro- having to roll a 25, we only have to roll a 20. And we've got two guys who are like, I think Tuttle is plus eight. And uh, Hiroji is plus seven with their med checks. So uh, 
I think we're going to be good with uh, our, our healing. So we also got some cable line. Um, we got antitoxin. We got a vial just in case anybody misses their poison saving throw. Uh, we got a big old eight person tent for 200 credits. And, uh, oh, good thing we got uh, Waylos as our porter. He's going to be carrying all of this bulk since he doesn't have uh, um, what you mean, Jig, a, uh, armor to worry about. And we got a couple weeks, weeks of rations for all of us. And we got some hot climate environmental clothing, to, just because uh, this is going to be the, the jungle. There's some pretty bad bush out there. So uh, in case our armor doesn't sustain us i think i i have the highest level armor level five that's only five days of uh comfort uh we have some backup clothing so we don't have to actually make stamina checks every i think what is it every hour before uh getting overheated and then we got some uh of course some ammo rusty got some ammo and uh roji got a high ultra ultra high capacity battery yes um for uh that's you putting that in your gun or your that gun is going right into my arc pistol yes chris beamer is playing the lushunta operative hiroji okay okay so you got many shots you, you can sustain quite a long battle in that if we're falling back you'll be the person to uh hold you know hold back any advancers so the rest of us can uh reach safety so uh, i think that was yeah i think we spent pretty much everything that we got um mo is down to eight credits so we ain't buying anything else so what i think was really nice is the group decided to buy only poor rations for the four people who'd be traveling but then to get actually like higher quality rations for the group leader so yeah. rusty has those bob marquis is playing the human envoy rusty carter Oh, is that okay? All right, yeah, but okay. And I think we only got three frag grenades. I think uh, I bought three. Additional. You ran out of money too. Obviously, I'm out of money. Yeah. I'm yeah. Out of money. <laughs> uh, but that's what we bought. Actually, you got a lot of grenades because don't forget you still have nine goblin grenades, Roji. Oh, I forgot about those. I will. I would like to carry a few of those. Check your character sheet. Make it on. You there. have them. You have nine right. goblin grenades. Oh, nice. You have all of them. I have all of them. Yeah, remember the how, goblin how? grenades were given to you by. Um... Oh yeah, oh yeah. Remember I didn't see it on my sheet. That all right? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna redo my sheet and make it nice and then send it to you. And remember those. Where were... is that last goblin? He was the best party member I've been with yet. Uh... He he has a he actually I think they did a sideshow. They did a spinoff with him. It's um, right. it's really strange though. It's a cooking show. You wouldn't think a goblin would know how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you, he doesn't know how to cook, but people <laughs> seem to like it. Yeah, that's where the laughs begin. Yeah. So I think we are, uh, uh, we got our hot, hot climate suits on. Uh, we've got our, our ammo. We're, yeah, we're good for the bush. So I think we're going to head over to the Port Authority and uh, make our way to the Elf Gate to uh, teleport to the, uh, the outpost. What about Cheddar? Did at least Cheddar get like a car wash or some oil or something? He, he got the budget detailing package. Uh. Jason McDonald is playing the Soki mechanic Tuttle Blacktail and his drone Cheddar. <laughs> Just a can of Pens oil or something. Yeah, he's going to rust in the jungle. That's going to be bad news. So Woolhulse runs up after you guys go on your little spree and Sure enough, he has like a backpack filled and you see like things sticking out of it and like, you know, totally useless in the bush. And he's running up. He's like, guys, 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 uh, I'm going to come with you. I decided uh, I only live once. So uh, uh, what's the worst that can happen? You guys are world famous adventurers, right? You're going to protect me. And and this is going to be great. I can't wait. I've I got my camera here. I, I got some rations. I, I got a journal here. Oh, man, I'm, I can't wait to tell my mammy all about it. That's a lot to carve on a tombstone. <laughs> yeah, you, you remember the scene in Platoon in the beginning when he, Yeah, he, that's he, the scene like, I'm thinking this. about. You don't need that. You don't need that. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> the thing. I couldn't remember what movie it was from. I was like, oh, man. Yeah, we got some stuff for you, uh, Waylos. Here. We got uh, 
get rid of the typewriter. Yeah, Rusty got you a industrial backpack. Oh, wow. Thanks so much. Yeah, a little nicer than yours. We got this really, really fancy tent. We're going to need you to set that up at night, but but that's for us. Yeah. But if you could carry it around for us, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course. Of course. Man, I, I can get rid of my uh, my Space Kitty backpack and, and use a big boy backpack. I can't wait. You can paint Space Pitty, Kitty on the side of it, but, you know, yeah. on the new one. But This, you know, is, just a big boy's, this is a big boy's backpack. Oh, excellent, excellent. I can't wait. Um, uh, uh, I, I brought some snacks, too. Uh, does anyone want some uh, uh, wafer bars? Uh, they're a specialty of my Nana's. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll take some of those. Sounds great. Thanks. Uh, does he have any problems carrying? Uh, well, geez, the tent is the big one, but we've also Already got uh, that one on him. Yep. all the food, the, the, the weeks of rations. Um, I don't know what his strength is. Oh, uh, no, it should be no problem whatsoever. Uh, uh, you, you can load him up, and uh, he's, yeah. actually, um, he's actually pretty strong. I mean, he's That's not, good. like, soldier strong, but we'll figure it all out. But I think he's okay. He's probably right about at his limit before he's going to start slowing you down. But he should be okay to carry all that. And if that's a problem, we're going to start throwing out Nana's cooking and his camera and, you know, his clothing and other things. That'll be fine. Well, the, the cooking will lighten as the journey goes on. So, well, be a- I, I did bring uh, five different pairs of shorts. Is, is, is that too many? Oh, and three different pairs of hiking boots. And, you know, I brought plenty and plenty of underwear. I mean, you can, you know, it's going to be a jungle. I, nope. I figured I need a new you pair for every that. day. You don't need this. You don't need that. <laughs> You don't need this. Exactly. Well, you know what? You're right. I, I, I could just turn the uh, underwear inside out, or uh, I'll figure something out. Uh, I think I have some space for breeze I can just bring with us. <laughs> do you have Do you have a weapon? A weapon? Uh, well, I, I, I do have this. And he uh, pulls out a knife that Mr. Hiroji has not seen before. Oh, really? What do you mean? Yes. Uh, but Mo has obviously seen it since he's a soldier. He's he knows his way. In of fact, course. it is one of the knowledge things that <laughs> he actually has. He has military knowledge. Yeah, you have knowledge knife. You put skill points in a knowledge knife. No, no military matters. It's a special thing for mercenaries. Yeah. In fact, he pulls out this knife, and on the knife, there's actually a little button, and he squeezes the trigger, and then it suddenly ignites in flame. Ooh. What is that? I want that. He's like, oh, uh, this is actually a family heirloom, uh, an inferno knife. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of these. They were, uh, you know, kind of a dud, but, you know, I keep it around. You know, I use it more as a flashlight than anything else. Cool. That's a I cool like thing. That. Yes, I can tell you all about it. Since Mo knows, Mo will say, you know, in fact, you know what? I'm going to have Mo read this because it'll be more fun. Give me a second, Mo. Yeah, I see a, I see some things that are Inferno, but not an Inferno knife. Okay, so the Inferno knife. Oh, okay. Let's see. Not all developments in military technology are su- successful. Uh, it's de- originally, it was designed to be a perfect a perfect survival tool, but the Inferno Knife combines the cutting prowess of the survival knife with the virtues of a lighter and a road flare. Uh, that sounds pretty cool. Uh, squeezing the trigger, you can inject a small stream of fuel from the hilt reservoir onto the blade's tip, and a secondary trigger ignites it, creating a small torch for to signal others or light campfires. That's actually a good knife. I'm really respecting this boy. Um, the par- product launch was disastrous, and users logged hundreds of complaints about knives' ne- needless complexity. Uh, as a result, the knives have flooded the market and become too uh, showy for. Oh, it's a showy weapon for criminals and uh, performers. Though. Uh, Though timing the blade's ignition in uh, combat remains an unpredictable arc. Okay, so it's a little bit too unwieldy, a little bit too complex. Uh, it costs 2,100 credits and has light bulk. That's pretty... Uh, is it an operative weapon? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, 
It's a fourth level basic melee weapon with uh, analog and operative special properties. It deals one d four slashing damage. It has one d six critical hit effect for uh, burn. Uses petrol as fuel, and it contains oh, it's enough fuel to light for one full hour. Wow. So it's also a torch. So each successful critical hit reduces the remaining duration by five minutes. Wow. And a single charge of petrol refuels the weapon's reservoir. Cool. Oh, I'm, I'm proficient with that, but go ahead, boy. You need something. Yeah, he, I'm glad he has something. I was going to hand him a rock. Uh, can you use that knife to actually, like, cook? <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. I, I'm well versed in cooking. And he pulls out like sandwiches and he's like, I have, I have peanut butter. Uh, I have tuna salad. Uh, I, I also have some, uh, ham and cheese. Uh, I, I made sandwiches for all of you. Excellent. Glad to hear. All right. All right, kid. Um, that's good. That's all we need to. Are we headed? Does he know? Do we have? Do we need to know how to get to the port authority? Is that how, is that a journey in and of itself to get there? How far is that away from where we are? I go to the port authority. Oh, the port authority is really, really simple. You just say you want to get there, and then poof, you're there. I go to the port authority. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, poof, we're at the port authority. Always assume it's easy until you hear a complication. It's much All simpler. Right, well. So it's actually late. It's kind of dinner time and you get to the Port Authority. So the Port Authority is where Quarbarth conducts trade by land, sea, and air, like many of the settlements on Castrobel. And it does maintain a number of the magical gates, the elf gates. And this is where you can quickly ferry commerce between the various continents quickly and easily. But of course, they have to, you know, regulate this. Otherwise, people would be just throwing everything through the gates, including weapons, bombs, things like that. So, Drugs. yeah, it's 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 a very tightly regulated area, and you have to go through it. So you guys can see it's a lot very busy. It's you know, it's kind of like an airport only instead of airlines. You're taking gates, and, and we're laden down with weapons, so we shouldn't have any problem getting through there. Not at all. It's like the Wild West. People are allowed to walk around with weapons. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So we go there. We just do whatever process it takes to get through the Elf Gate. And I don't okay. know if it's a so schedule thing. Do we have to grow our ears like longer? Or, I yeah, mean, that's not going to happen, no. You, um, you actually need to go pick up your visas, so your travel visas, so you can... Um, okay get through the gate that's kind of like your ticket you get your visas at one of the many desks and she looks at you and says oh you're gonna want to talk to the uh, gate controller rayani she uh she wants to talk to you before you uh you go uh she'll be waiting for you at the gate what's her name rayani okay uh i have no objections to talking to her so you go to the appropriate gate I even have a little picture here. When I say multi-pass. Yeah. I have the fast pass. We have multi-pass. Yeah, we get to walk right through the short line. Well, anyhow, she shows up and she says, oh, yes, I, I wanted to talk to you fellows. I was informed by the police of what happened, and I wanted to find out, since it's extremely rare that this gate is used. Only maybe a couple hundred people use it per year, and it's usually for academic research or resupplying purposes. And uh, I wanted to talk to you about what we discovered to help you on your search as we are concerned as much as the police were. We have no objection to being informed. She pulls up a small data pad and wants to show you. She says, after I heard about what happened, I was quite perturbed. So I looked at the assignment logs over the past three days. And I can tell you right now that no employees were sent to the university. And there's so few people who travel to to Hula Point uh, since it's a largely decommissioned military base and research station that it was easy to track down anyone who went there recently. 
and she pulls it up and sure enough she says there's only one group that we found that fit that description a team of 15 that was carrying laboratory equipment cryogenically frozen organic compounds specialty foodstuffs and authorization from the Quarbarth university itself mm. wow it's very suspicious <laughs> Yes, yes. I did a double check, and I thought you might find this interesting. It did seem like Dr. Solstarny was in tow. She was the uh, Kasatha. In addition, there was a Sheeran, two humans, and 11 Lashuntas. Mm. She And you say that she was uh, looking not herself? She looked sick? Yes, I can. I can tell that she definitely looked ill. But they assured her that it was just food poisoning before she went onto the gate. They assured the gate agent that she was fine and that she would just need a day of rest. I see. Well, that's some good news. So anyhow, with that, I just wanted to inform you: they did bring a huge amount of equipment with them. It was something we remembered, but they did have all the proper permits and visas, so we really thought nothing of it. And researchers from the university often bring quite a bit of equipment. In fact, you appear to be very sparsely packed for such a dangerous journey. When did they leave? How, how uh, soon ago? How how long ago? Three days ago. Okay. Well, chances are. Of a sightseeing party. Yeah, yeah. Pleasure. Well, with that, um, are you ready to enter the gate? Absolutely. Ready. So she powers it up and sort of the Stargate type of thing appears. And it's watery and all special. And Hiroji's seen this all before because he's done this. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah. I've been out in the wild before. Yeah, well, this is how you get around the planet. You know, it's no big deal. Yeah, we are. uh, We're crossing over. Weapons hot, however. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i'm not oh yeah oh yeah well you carry what do you carry as a weapon a big ass spear i have a big old pike and i intend to use it nice all right gentlemen you're gonna in, enjoy the bounty that is castrova i do have one question are elves the original species on this planet before the Lashunta and the formians uh we don't talk about the formians really because they're you know before the Lashanta and the, the more powerful race, were the elves here first? Sorry, I didn't refer to them this time. No, the elves were not here first. And yet, these are ancient ruins that we're going to find. And that the only transportation are elf gates. Yeah, they came afterwards. The the, the, I think the elves are the only ones who have the technology to actually teleport people around like this. Elves use a lot more magic. Yeah. Okay. So these are yeah, magical gates is. or not tech or are they tech? They're magic. Oh. Never mind. Yeah, and apparently are... from long, long ago. I will be interested in how long. Long, long time ago. Before Lashanta there were people in the jungle. Yeah, they're they're ancient. They uh they're ancient. They have been around for as long as well, society. Well, I'm thinking before Lashanta society. I'm thinking the Lashanta are, you know, new. No, you got to read your history. Yeah, you got to know your history. Is the is the gate open? Yeah, you can walk right through. Are you suggesting that perhaps the Lashenta are uh, piggybacking on the uh, on somebody else's uh, technology? I wasn't so much suggesting it as absolutely stating it. Ha! Well, you're you're about to see the bounty of my planet, so let's let's let us go. And I walk through the gate. Pop, 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 okay, boom. let's your, see the bounty by your going planet through. in quotes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, enough talk. Most going through. Yep, go through. You go through. Suddenly, within the blink of an eye, fuching, you are in glorious sunrise. You uh, were in one side of the planet where it was dark and night, and now it is, well, it appears to be early dawn. You dawn are of a new day. Wow. Well, you're literally went halfway across the planet, so it's wow, quite that's a different funny. time here. Behold the power of our society. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny that there is a time change. I was questioning the wisdom of going through the gate in the evening, but uh, you'll just have to question Mo's wisdom of uh, sidereal time. We crossed the international dateline. We're good. It's tomorrow. So you you appear. You see in front of you the station of Trujula Point sits at the tip of a broad peninsula covered in rolling plains and expanses of tall, pale green grasses that shimmer with violent hues in the wind. 
short-lived blooms of magenta fungus tower nearly 20 feet over the landscape, though many have begun to wilt and others are marred by bite marks of half a dozen sites. Thundering calls echo across the plains as immense six-legged creatures with long swooping necks trek steadily across the grass towards the western jungles. Beyond rises the singing range, its peaks barely visible through the haze. The actual military outpost you are in is a strange combination of both ancient and new. It is obviously been decommissioned for many, many years, and there appears to be a token force here just to keep the wildlife at bay. You see a male human come up to you and greet you and say, ah, I was expecting you. I was informed by the university you would be coming right on time. Let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Kahal Nafa. I have been instructed to help you and equip you and bring you to your departure point in the jungle. We're going into the jungle? Uh, y yes. Uh, isn't that why you're here? Yes, it is. And I take a deep breath and I say, and thus the hunt begins. Well, the nice stroll through the woods. That's all. Okay. Swampy. Oh, I thought, okay. Mo was a little confused about, he thought we were going to be investigating this uh, outpost. I thought it was abandoned. No, no this well, is an old fortification that was a remnant of the war that we had with the, uh, with those other, with the Formians. Ah. Uh, and uh, it's not, not been used for that, that, that since the war has been long over. Yeah, it's there's a token force here to keep the wildlife away. Uh, I see. All right. This is sort of a rallying point. Um, can we ask about the group that came before us from the university? Where'd yes, they go? yes. They, uh, they came and departed into the wilderness uh, a little bit more than a day ago. And they seem to be largely consisted of heavily armed Lashunta mercenaries. They, what I overheard is they seem to be heading towards some elven runes to the northwest to perform some archaeological survey work uh, with the oversight of Dr. Solstarni, though the Kasatha appeared to be quite groggy and perhaps ill. Yeah. Yeah. And they were a day ahead. They must have stayed in this fort for a couple of days, no? Yeah, they, they did need a day to actually get all of their equipment arranged, but they did uh, leave a little bit more than a day ago. Did they go with vehicles, or are they carrying their equipment? Oh, no, no, no. There's strict guidelines that control vehicle traffic in this part of the reserve. You must proceed only on foot. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's good news for us. Yes, yes. Come inside, and I'll show you the map of where I think they were going. Excellent. Let us do that. Okay, yeah. I have no objections. So, sure enough, you uh, you go inside, and as I said before, it's uh, the fort is quite interesting, as it is, a, uh, you can tell it is thousands of years old, yet it also has proper technology and propped up with metal beams and more advanced weaponry. But really, it's just sort of a small token force and just a small staff that is here. He pulls up a couple of maps and shows you uh, a little bit of the region. I can bring it up right now. Oh, good. He shows you where you are. He says, as you can see here in Ukalam, here we are at Tuhuli Point, and the singing range is to the southwest, as you can see. Uh, where are we? Where are you talking about on the map? Can you place a marker or something? Oh, I see. Okay, so we're on the uh, uh, northwest continent. I see. On the eastern coast, about midway through the continent, uh, uh, Tarhula Hulu Point. Tarhulu Point. Yeah, that's where you are now. Cool. And they went to that other dot that's uh, west of us? Uh, no, they seem to have gone towards the... Give me a second. They went west-northwest through a trackless expanse of subtropical forest. But from what I know, if they're trying to find the Forbidden City, and he pulls up some calculations, he says, that's approximately 120 miles west-northwest of where we are now. 
Okay, and on this map, how far is that? Are we passing through the mountain range there on the east coast? You'll be coming right to the very edge of the mountain range, yes. So we'll have to go over the mountains or not? I believe you'll get right to the edge of the mountains. You actually won't have to go over them. I estimate the journey to the abandoned city will probably take around 10 to 12 days of steady travel on foot. Not a problem. Sounds great. Yeah. And you say they were heavily armed, eh? Yes, yes. They they appeared to be heavily armed and had quite a bit of equipment with them. You you should actually... He's like doing a little tracing through it. He goes, unfortunately, the forest continuously changes. That is always being reborn and regrowth. So it's very hard to get accurate maps. And quite frankly, there's no reason to. We can get you to approximately 10 miles out and drop you off. But then you'll have to do the rest of the journey on foot. I would think that first you would go through the fairly sparse lowlands around the point, then to the dense tropical rainforest to the northwest, and then finally to the foothills of this singing range where you'll find the forsaken city. Yeah. How many, uh, how many, uh, how big was their party in total? 15 in total. Okay. Okay. All right. Well. Okay. All right, let's take off. Yeah. Oh, wait, before you go, I forgot to tell you. And he, like, pulls open a, a locker. And he's like, this is for you. Uh, I was able to um, uh, get some provisions for you as well. Oh, very goody, goody. What Wonderful. do we got? Great. You look inside. There is a scratched-up suit of Lashunta Ringwear Mark II armor. Oh, you're kidding me. And I already... Lashunta what? That's what it's what money That's is. what I bought with all my money. Oh my god. That is amazing. A well, car- rainwear mark two. I think that's what I bought yep. too. A so. carbon steel curve blade. Oh really? What is that? A sticky bomb grenade mark two. Four doses of tier one antitoxin. Four doses of spray flesh. Excellent. Good. He also has three weeks worth of field rations for each of you. Wow. All right. And as well as one Inferno knife. Oh, nice. Okay, so. Divvy that that around to everyone evenly, and that's great. Yeah. Sounds good. God, I wish I could have held off on the Lushunta. Well, well. actually, you can't sell stuff, right? No. That heavy armor? Yeah, it's heavy armor. That I mean, oh. that's what I spent all of my money on. I'm guessing the that's carbon bad. steel curved blade, which we actually didn't think of, it's probably like a machete to cut your way through the jungle. I bet. Um, it's 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 a good weapon. It's a uh, does D10 slashing damage. Um, the problem is it, it's a two bulk. Uh, I really don't need it. I hate to say. Possibly Cheddar could use it. it might be oh, upgrade. really? Well, no, it might be an great. upgrade on the on the razor bat, depending on great what type of what type of melee weapon it no, is. No, it's analog, dude. You're you're golden. It's not it's not exotic or anything. Oh, that's so good. If Cheddar can't, I'll take it. But honestly, Rusty has no plans to be that close to an enemy, so he doesn't like melee. I'm actually. It has two bulk, by knife. the way. I'm sorry, Chris. You're proficient in it. Great. Are you? No, I'm I'm proficient in that knife. That's an operative knife. Oh, okay. Uh, It is an operative knife. Yeah. I I, I guess I'll hold on to that. Cool. Then you'd be a little more excited about that weapon. It's cool. It's just it does does very little damage, unless you crit. Well, you already have. You're going to be using your knife anyhow, I guess. Yeah, I've kind of turned away from knife, and I'm going to go more gun, but I do like to have a good knife also. Well, it also is a uh, torch. It is. I like that. It's cool. It's, it's fire. Fire is always good. Actually, I'm not sure Cheddar can use the carbon steel blade because it's a two-handed weapon. Yeah. I just realized that, too. It's okay. Um, all right. Um, Anything yeah. you don't need, you can leave here, including if you have any extra supplies, but you won't be coming back here for several weeks. If we come back at all. True. Well, I mean, I'll be coming back. I'm not so sure about the rest of you. Okay, so I can take. See, the thing is, is that that blade isn't. It is an upgrade. Like my 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 pike does one to eight damage. However, it has reach, and that is really really what I want. Yeah. Um, 
I'm going to forego those two extra points and keep my reach. I'm yeah, just, and, and it's too bulk. That's the thing. That's always the thing. It's not going to be money. Yeah. It's 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 what we can carry. That's a lot. I mean, my pike is too bulk. So it is a lot. The um, I mean, do you have the bulk to carry it also, or no? I can carry it out there, and I guess I could do that. In fact, we, I'm going to do that because honestly, we can't sell it for very much. It's going to sell for 200 credits uh, if we have to sell it, but. Um, I'm just thinking that we may need something to slash the vines and shit away from, like, you know, like, I forgot about that. Like, in yeah, general, we have a yeah. machete. Like, my pike is piercing, so maybe it's good to have a slashing weapon in case there's something. So uh, I'm going to hood. I assume that has some holster or, you know, or uh, some uh, a sh- a scabbard. A sh- a sheath or something. <laughs> for which? That has a uh, sheath for it. Oh, yeah, yeah. It comes with all the equipment. Yeah. Okay. Wear it on your back. It'd be cool. Yeah. All right. So. I'm still not a, I'm I'm still not encumbered. I'm far from it, but it means that's that's less than you know. We can't take as much back with us. So, all right, cool. That's true. Um, so who's taking what? Most taking uh, the blade. I'll take the sticky grenade. I'm taking the inferno knife. We're leaving the ring wear, unless our guy wants to wear it or can wear it. He probably can't. No, definitely not. I guess we each take a spray flesh and we each take an antitoxin, right? Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, they gave us three weeks of rations each. That is a lot. That's expecting us to be out there. It's also very heavy. What kind of sticky was it? Mark uh, two. Mark two. Thank you. How ma- I'm going to ask, how many uh, rations did they take? Uh, I don't know. They they had all their own equipment. They only came here to rest and set up for a long journey. They seem to be fully stocked. Well, you know what? It's only how, how, how many days a journey is it out there? About 10 to 12 days. Okay, so two, three. I think we should take the, the, the food. We're just not going to be, well, we're going to be encumbered while we're traveling. That's fine. We'll just be ready to drop stuff because there's no way that uh, Wayless can carry all that. That's a lot of weight. I don't know. Are we encumbered, Steve? Well, the 10 to 12 days is assuming 30 feet. If you're encumbered, does it change your speed? I forget. Yes. Then it's going to take a lot longer than... Uh, Are we encumbered right now, Steve? No. As of now, no, but depending on how much of the stuff you get, because the, the each week of field rations is one bulk per week. So that's 15 bulk right there. All right. I'm not taking my portion of the field ration. Yeah. Okay, so... We don't need to carry that. Wayless is basically like, I don't know how much he can carry. How can we can load him up? You can tell me if you want to load him up to the brink and then we'll go from there. Oh, yeah. We're definitely right. loading him up to the brink. Yep. Um, cause, That's right. Okay. No problem. Also, say, I believe with survival, you can forage for food. Yes. Yeah. Live off the true. land, it's called. I can live off yeah. the land. Yeah. That's, that's for our return. Actually, we don't need to. We, I don't want to get far behind from these guys. Um, I think we should just take rations to get us there. So that's basically, what, two weeks? That's plenty. <laughs> get the rations, kill them, take their food, and Take their back. rations. That's, that's my true. plan. Yep. Yeah. Also, if you do succeed, you probably don't have to rush back and could even come back encumbered. Right, right. Sounds okay. good. So, do we want to take any of these extra rations out there? Because we do have what we need with us. Load him up until he's not quite encumbered, yeah, and then okay. we go from there. That's fine. I'll take care of that. Cool. Um, okay. He also offers you consumer backpacks and mass-produced tents if you need them. Uh, we already took care of all yeah, that. we got that. Um, Thank you. And by the way, your pathetic little tents. I'm oh. sorry. Your your very kindly offered. They're generous. Yeah. Tents. We're, we're, we're great. That's. What's a mass-produced backpack? That sounds cheap. That, that, no, yes. it's consumer backpack, mass oh. produced tents. Oh, they are they both cheap. sound cheap. <laughs> they are cheap. They, they are both. <laughs> they're both fine for you know regular folk. All right, they're the loners basically. I think they they sound like they're made on Earth. Well, in addition, he also also offers you the recharging stations if you need to charge up your armor and weapons. He does strongly suggest that you fully charge your armor as it is going to be quite hot out there and you're definitely going to need some protection from the elements. Oh, yeah, we're definitely going to do that. 
I assumed we were already fully charged. But yeah, yeah, I assume. Yeah, we just walked right through the gate. We didn't yeah. travel to get here. Oh, really. He doesn't know that. He's just yeah. being hospitable. In addition, he does say that if you need some ammunition, we do have some limited supply that we can provide you. Basically, basic ammunition if you need some. And some batteries as well, I would hope. Batteries are ammunition. Yes, I can give you each one battery if you need be. Wonderful. I I, I will take that, yeah. I'll take one. You can never be too sure about that. Sure. Because we need batteries to power our suits. We need batteries to power our weapons. We need batteries to power our tent. Right? Yep. Your tent uses a battery? It does. It does use a battery. Hey, spare no expense. Wow, that's got to be some tent. Is this the tiny hut? It is. Do you ever see Joe versus the volcano? Of there course. Oh yeah. Because I want to get those. I want those. I want that luggage. I saw that with Jason and McDonald's. <laughs> in fact, in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Correct. Honestly, this entire episode has been fascinating as a luggage problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is pretty what is. Nice right. packing. Jason, are you there? Yeah, I'm sorry. What, what did we see? I was like, there were a couple people talking at the same time. Oh, we were talking about Joe versus the volcano, and I was saying, "Oh right, you yeah. and I saw that together in Pittsburgh in Squirrel Hill, I believe." I believe or we maybe, did. Yes. Maybe it was Monroeville. And did you no, review it? it? Bro- yeah, I did though. review it. Yeah, you did review it. I don't recall I, liking it very much, I'm though. Not saying that, I know he can get the job. Can he do the job? I'm not arguing with that with you. I'm not arguing with you. <laughs> That's the one thing I remember. That is such a good scene. I'm not arguing with you. So All right. That's a great All point. right, Felix, let's go, Felix. <laughs> okay, so what 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 medicines did they give us again? I just want to put this on my tier one antitoxins and spray flesh. Yeah, we all got one spray of, uh, flesh. one spray okay, flesh and right. one antitoxin each. Yeah. Excellent. He says, you know, just in case you get infected, but you you should be okay. I I doubt you're going to be, you know, doing anything extremely dangerous. You're just, go, you know, you're just trekking through the jungle. I would strongly advise you, uh, you know, if you see any wild animals or, you know, wildlife, that you steer clear of it. Ah, the opposite. We are here for the hunt. They really don't have any sort of means of transporting cargo. Well, uh... Perhaps. Uh, let's see what we can jerry-rig, maybe. So I'm a little leery of leaving too much of the uh, rations behind, but at the same time, I do agree we don't really want to carry all that stuff and be all encumbered. Why? Well, you have survival, too, don't you? Well, I mean, yeah, we I can pretty so. much... I mean, the only, pr- the only reason why we wouldn't live off the land is that it would slow us down. And I don't even know if it would even do that. Yeah, it's it's pretty good living off the land. And actually, I have a fairly low survival, like one rank in survival, so I'm at plus three. Yeah, but you only need a ten, and uh, and every oh, okay. every every couple points, every two points above a ten, you can feed someone else. Yeah, I have a plus. I have a plus seven. I'm going to so. tell you something, Tuttle, that you might not be aware of. I am ninety nine percent sure that Cheddar can carry gear because the cargo rack says. Your drone is outfitted with cargo space. The drone strength score counts as four higher for the purpose of Ooh. now determining how much bulk oh, it can carry. Oh, that's a but good thing. But all of that extra bulk must be stored uh, gear and cargo, not mounted weapons, armor mods, and the like. And this does not affect the drone's actual strength score, blah, blah, blah. So uh, due to the size, this drone may not be able to carry uh, awkward or unwieldy. I think the cargo rack just gives him more to carry. So it doesn't say explicitly, but I would read that as that he can carry stuff. Yeah, okay. That's not surprising. Crazy? Do I sound wrong? No, that, that sounds right. I'm, I'm willing to buy it. So if you want to slap a backpack on <laughs> on Cheddar and throw some stuff on there. I mean, he's pretty I mean, strong. He's got a 14 strength, so... Oh, my that God! Him, <laughs> that gives us an that additional bulk. 7 bulk without affecting things. And uh, way less... Is, carrier. Dude, that's... that's the, okay, that's a huge... De- oh, my God, that is ridiculously huge. Okay, that's oh, actually... You, I mean, I think, I think Cheddar's weapons would count against... Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, definitely they'll count. His weapons will count. So let's just call it, I'm going to look at the math after this. Like, we'll call it five for now. Or if you just want to be safe, we'll say five bulk. Okay, then for the moment, we'll load them down with five bulk of rations. We can always throw them away later. Sure. So, there you go. So, you know, I, I, I never, I'll never. i take a look at this. But if the cargo rack just adds more bulk, then that must mean that he always had the bulk to carry. So, yeah. 
And in fact, it's uh, like Cheddar is the MVP of this party. He does everything, man. It's it's the packing uh, edition. It's the the packing uh, episode. He slices. He dices. He does julienne tomatoes. You name it. I'm going to uh, spend a minute to predict the weather for the next day. Wow. Now you're nice. talking. Nice. I completely Very fail. Nice. You predict that it will be hot and sunny. <laughs> it's going to be hot and sunny. Yeah. Really going out on a limb there. Yep. The next weather report will be in four days. Uh, yeah, no, you know what? I think Mo is going to predict the weather. Is that a survival skill? Yep. Okay. Uh, Mo predicts it's going to be cold and snowy. Wow. (laughs) Even, oh gosh. You guys suck at rolling. Well, yeah. A 10 and a 9. Yep, it happens. Anyone else want to try to predict the weather? I'm going to predict it's going to be tropical tomorrow. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the weather is. I just want to see if it's going to rain. We're we're under a canopy anyway, so we're we're going to be fine. Uh, I brought my, I brought all weather gear, gear. I'm fine. So, a few things of interest. One, you guys have been up all day. So, you probably can go... I gotta do the math there, but, you know, it's like still nighttime for you. You could probably still go another eight hours, but then you will need to rest, which should be okay. Yeah. Um. So, do keep that in mind. And also, you know, are you going to put on the environmental protection below your armor? All that stuff, I presume so, right? Yeah, of course. Uh... Honestly, no when I bought to, those to clothes, yeah. yeah. I mean, when I bought those clothes, I put them on. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, I'm just making sure that that's. Of course, not, I'm not going to assume anything with you. No, guys. I get it. You're right. I didn't say it out loud. Mo just can so, be like just so I understand. Just so I understand, the armor does everything that stuff does, though. Correct. What this does is the environmental protection just doubles the. I think it doubles the armor. Environmental protection. What does it do? Actually, I got to read it. It's just, uh, it it does the same thing. It just prolongs it for a cheaper. It doubles uh, the bonus you get. Okay. Oh, it doubles the bonus. So that's still bonus to your fortitude save, among other things. But we we have five. We we don't need to make a fortitude save unless our armor wears out. Well, it was all a waste of time then, John. Okay, let's move on. No, 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 no. It's perfectly fine. So with that, let's just go through real quick. I don't know if it's automatic. I don't know if we have to have our armor on even. I mean, you can you can walk through the jungle like normal. Like, yeah, walk yeah. The jungle. I don't think it's. I think it's only certain times it might be severe. It's not. Yeah, it's. it's uh, he can tell you. Um, he says, "Oh yeah, you're going to be having to p- turn your protections on approximately twelve hours a day uh, when the sun is out." Right. Okay. So sure. from eight to eight, that's when you'll need it. Okay, so that does make sense to have that stuff under the armor if it's a 10-day journey. So, okay. So, Hiroji, what level armor do you have? Five. Um, oh, five? Uh, five, yeah. Tuttle? Oh, geez, I have the Estic suit, too, which I think is it's level five as well. Rusty, what level armor do you have? Hold on. It's probably level two. One sec. Uh, level four, sorry. Lashunta Tempweave. Okay, so Hiroji, Mo, Tuttle have five days worth of protection. Rusty has four. If you're going to need it about 12 hours a day, you can do the math. So if you use it half the day, so Hiroji has 10, Mo, 10, Tuttle, 10, and Rusty, uh, eight. When you but don't that just have means it. I need to replace the battery, right? No. You, there's no battery for the protection for the suit. Okay. So the way it works is. Every hour that you do not have protection in hot sun, you have to make a fortitude save, DC 15 plus 1 per hour. If you fail, you take 1d4 non-lethal fire damage. However, you have a minus 4 to the save if you're wearing armor. So basically a DC 20 save. And what's that special thing we have to do, though? The that will give you a plus two to your save. So it ends up being, and all the math is said and done, it's a DC 18, and then increases by one every hour. So That's, in theory, you could turn it on and then, you know, like off at night or right before, so you save a few hours of battery. So, But you can't recharge your armor until you get to, like, a Starship or a port. Uh, that, does not, that does not use batteries. It has a self-sustained power source. So we wear our suits on the way out there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, that's 
I mean, we won't have to make fort saves because the suit gives us protection. It's only when you turn off the suit, exactly. Right, okay. So, Anyhow. Okay, good. So with that... All right, someday we're actually going to leave town. I'm <laughs> so excited to it. It's been like five sessions. All uh, right. All right, relax. I know Bob gets antsy if there's not well, true I, I don't ever want to do the same thing all the time. I think that's a fairly normal thing. You're completely right, but do keep in mind that... This is it. Like, I don't have to be telling you, you don't have gear. Oh, you yeah. ain't finding it. So, Good. yeah. All right. Well, cool. I'm, I'm ready for combat, though. I'm ready to roll for combat is what I am. Excellent. So. I prefer to talk my way out of things. But oh, well. Like, don't want to fight that dragon. I don't want to. F- you just <laughs> need a higher initiative than Mo. That's all you're going to need. So <laughs> it's easy. Excellent. Yeah. Hey everyone, Steve here. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. I do promise this is the end of all the packing and inventory management. This is it. There's no more. After this, these guys are going into the jungle and they're either going to survive and get to the end or they're going to die because there is no rescue. They are going to be stranded. So I apologize if you thought this might have gone on a little long. But it was a lot of preparation, and everyone seems to like it, so we kept it in. But I promise you, next week, the action picks up quite quickly. However, before we get to the PaizoCon contest, I have my interview with Order of the Amber Die. I met with them about two weeks ago. They were meeting to play Book 3 of the Ruins of Aslanti Adventure Path for Pathfinder. And I managed to go hook up with them. This actually took a while. I've been trying to do this actually with book one and book two, but we couldn't work it out. So finally, I was able to hook up with them, check out their secret lair, take a whole bunch of cool pictures, and talk to them on all things Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder, as their group is scarily similar to ours. Although we play a little differently, our backgrounds and the way we play and even the personalities of our people are scarily alike. We had a great time, and hopefully get to see him again, and maybe even play some Aslanti with him next time. Maybe I get to play an NPC, that would be great. Anyhow, enjoy the interview. So this is Steve, and I have some special guests this week. I have two members of the Order of the Amber Dye. For those of you who don't know, the Order of the Ember Die, they basically get together a few times a year and play a Pathfinder module from beginning to end. That's right, like over like three or four days. And they sleep like maybe five hours throughout. And they just play, eat, and continuously play. It's sort of like college and steroids, only now they're in their 30s and their 40s. So here I have Adam Smith, who is the GM. And I have Eric Lim, who is the player captain. How are you guys doing? Doing great, Steve. Fantastic. So I am here in the secret headquarters of the Order of the Amber Die. And it's funny because it's like, if you can think of what a your your dream house would be filled with nothing but Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder books and videos and pictures and miniatures and maps. That is your house. <laughs> so that that is yeah. insane. <laughs> like the only thing that's missing is uh, outside. It was like a little castle outside. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. We've talked that's, about that's that in the before. future. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good life. It is a gaming paradise in here. That's that's for sure. <laughs> I know. This is so. definitely a gaming paradise. So, I mean, when you when you're not gaming, I mean, is it just does any of this go away, or is this always out? Um, it's pretty much always out. I, you know, it goes away to where you, know, you have to have company over and things like that. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> but but other than that, I mean, we're always in a state of gaming. I think yep. you know, we're always in a state of prep uh, or play. So we're, we never really stop. The order is, is continuous. So yeah. why don't we talk about the order? So the order of the amber die. I I found out about it myself a few years ago because I was going to run. The, um, the Emerald Spire, and that's where I found you guys. Okay. And then I downloaded your PDF, which I found very helpful, just to, even just to see your thoughts of like running a super dungeon, and you guys ran it from beginning to end. And the PDF you had was really interesting, and then I found out, oh my god, these guys play D&D, sorry, Pathfinder, like we used to play D&D in college, only they're still doing it. And... <laughs> 
that's insane and I want in. Like how, like, how did you manage to keep doing this now that you have jobs and families and lives? Uh, well, well um, he was a teacher. I was a teacher, so he had the summer off. I did not. I didn't have the summer off. But, uh, yeah, I got the least amount of sleep of everybody. I think I came in like a zombie <laughs> pretty much most mornings, but we made it through anyway. Yeah, that one was tough. The Emerald Spire yeah. in particular was one uh, one run of about 35 days where we played pretty much every day there for the 35 days. That could only have been done in the summer. But um, as far as the lifestyle of the order, uh, we plan everything around holidays. People use their days off. Uh, we try to play with our marathon format where we all come together for three or four days because it's so difficult to keep the group together otherwise. So people come from different states. They come from... Uh, we've had Ohio, Kansas, North Dakota, Maine, um, you know, and they all come in, for example, we're playing tomorrow, so they'll start arriving tonight and into tomorrow morning, uh, flying in, driving in, and then we'll play for four days, and then everybody goes back, and we won't see each other for uh, two, three months, depends on the schedule that we're working with uh, from Pi Zones and so forth. So. so do you actually play, so you play Adventure Paths, mm-hmm. and the one you're currently playing is... Uh, Ruins of Aslan? Yeah, right. right and, Ruins of Aslan. So you're doing the third book this weekend or the fourth book? Correct, the third book. Third book. Mm-hmm. So do you play with the same players from level one all the way to level whatever, 1720, the same PCs, or do you have to swap people in and out and stuff? <laughs> That's a complicated question. But for the most part, yes. We, we play the, the, the four core iconics that are presented in the artwork. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if a PC dies permanently, we can't bring them back then we had to think of options for other people so in the past we've created backup like iconics or sometimes we'll, someone will take over an npc that's pre- that's prevalent in the adventure path but uh yeah i mean we would like to that's what we hope for but sometimes it doesn't always happen and maybe also in regard to the players themselves yeah um there's the four core players that will represent each of the four iconics that are in the art for the ap mm-hmm. And those players are expected to be there for every hour of the entire campaign, and they will not change. That'll, that'll remain the same core four. The only way out of that, I guess, is character death. Um, but even then, right. uh, <laughs> we'd probably expect them. So when we first ask them to, to play an AP, we'll, we'll sort of ask the order. Uh, there's 15 of us, and we'll ask, you know, what's everybody doing for the next year? What does your schedule look like? Anyone want to try and get on this project? And then we'll get enough responses usually to have a core four. And you're committing to six marathons over the course of a year that'll be played and then presented on the Paizo blog. And, uh, yeah, you'll be expected. It's almost like, uh, having that just, you know, basic party. And then everybody else will jump in and play an NPC or they'll show up and play a monster sometimes yeah. or something, you know, like whatever they can do to contribute. So, yeah. So that's pretty funny. You've like turned it almost into a business. It's like, okay, if you guys want to play, you have to commit mm-hmm. and you have to play mm-hmm. this amount. I mean, for most adventure paths, you have you want people to commit anyhow. But with you guys, it's like not only do you have to commit, you have to travel and then spend like four days of your life in one location playing. Mm-hmm. It sounds kind of fun. It sounds like it's fun for the first day. And the second day, it sounds like it's kind of fun. And then the third and fourth day sounds like absolute torture. Uh, it's, it's nuts. It's, <laughs> I, yeah. I can see how it would look that way. And there have been different times where we've been worn down. You know what I mean? But that has that does nothing to our resolve. I mean, we're we're definitely dedicated to what we do and uh we finish, you know, strong as we start, you know, for the for the most part. Mentally, afterwards we can we can all, you know, you know, do what we need to do afterwards to like get back to our normal lives. But during those four days, I mean, yeah, we're we're all all systems go. Wow. Yeah. yeah. If you're looking for immersion, this is the ultimate immersion. You know, I've seen yeah. the, I've seen the pictures in the Paizo blogs, like when you guys did strange eons, you had like it was very cool. You had like all the lights and the candles, and it seemed. Although I think I'd fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, pretty intense. I mean, people are usually standing the whole time. Yeah. that's kind of how we like to play. And oh, the music will keep you yeah, going. Yeah, we too. have the music that we listen. We have a soundtrack for each uh, individual adventure path that we use. And uh, yeah, we'd say. I mean, actually, with Strange Rounds in particular, to bring that one up, I mean, it was in the dark a lot of it. Mm-hmm. I kind of made a rule for myself after that. I'm not jamming anymore. In the dark. <laughs> not not four days straight, six times in a year for in, <laughs> in the dark. It was just too much darkness. It was, oh man. But uh, but yeah, this one um, Aslan's been a lot of fun. We've actually played daylight hours. We've been mm-hmm. getting up at dawn. Yeah, we've re- yeah, every sunrise we tried to do. Yeah. So instead of underground in the dark, now we're on the beach in the sun. You know, right, in tropical first, weather, it's completely different. Right, I saw the pictures. The first one you actually did on the beach. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. So, that was a lot of yeah, fun. On location. Yeah, we went How'd to you keep it? It wasn't like windy or like, like oh my God. of dice flying all over the place. <laughs> yeah, it was actually. It was. It was. It was. The it was, board uh, almost fell over on me twice. Uh, it was definitely oh windy. It was, uh, you know, we have challenges with every, every sort of uh, piece of immersion we try to bring in. So mm-hmm. in Strange Hands, it might have been the darkness. Uh, this one was definitely the beach and then the sand mm-hmm. and the sun and all of that. I was more worried about the sand. I thought that it was going to end up everywhere in everybody's book, you know, and on the paper. You know, everything was just going to have sand in it after the, uh, the end of the marathon. But actually, it was pretty, yeah, it was wasn't fine. too bad. I mean, yeah, we, yeah. Were, we were on the second floor. It was okay. Yeah, you had a beach house on the Jersey Shore. And since the first module took place, on the beach, mm-hmm. primarily. I mean, we figured, why not just go to the beach and play it? Yep. You know? that's, the that's ambient the sound thing. was spot on. Seagulls, crashing waves, and wind. I mean, you can't really beat that. Yeah. Yeah, no, it sounds like you guys have a really good time. Well, what did you do for Emerald Spire, then? What was the immersion for that? <laughs> so, for Emerald Spire, yeah, that was interesting. So, each level, each author had a level. There were 16 right. levels, and each level had its own theme. So, we tried to create, we had a sound, uh, at least one song, actually, yeah. for each level. And then we had something we did for each one. Like, I can remember this one for sure, the magma level. We oh turned off the air conditioning. It was probably a hundred and something that like day. that. It was New here. Jersey summer here, so it was just brutal that particular day. And I'm like, why are we? I don't know why we're doing this. But <laughs> can, we, <laughs> can we turn? Can we, can we stop playing uh, the sauna for a second? Uh, like, I'd Liz, like to breathe. Like, I just remember just going through so much water and sweating. All my, and we had these <laughs> red lights on, so the whole room was red, and it was mm-hmm. just so hot in here. And we're like, can we turn the fan on? No, this is immersion. We can't, you know, <laughs> we have to live it. You guys want out? You got to beat this level. Oh, so know. wait, if you're feeling what your characters feel, do you guys like, like, Get little cuts when you get damaged. Oh no! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you definitely t- you feel the uh, you feel uh, the duress. I think that's much. what we really have sought. We, 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 we tried to get that feeling of, of what it's like to really try to crawl a dungeon. I mean, you know, you go through your characters sometimes are under stress for days at a time. They're sleeping in dank chambers and they have you know just a couple of lights <laughs> left and they're low on resources and right. they're nervous about the next Starving. room. And we just try to capture that feeling. Yeah, so. Well, it sounds like you're succeeding. This one, so th- tell me, how do you decide which adventure paths to choose? Like, is it just you work with Paizo directly? Is it always like you know the most, the, you know the most recent one, or how how are you decide? I mean, right now it looks like it's been the most recent ones. Yeah, we definitely have uh, the last few years here played the most recent one. I think that we often get a choice in the sense of like you know two come out a year, so uh, we could always pass on one and choose the next one, but. Um, we've been lucky in that we've wanted to play everything that's come out yeah. in, in recent years here. So we really, we were excited about Aslan. Um, and you know, what's, what's coming up after that. And so, you know, we're kind of, um, we always have a discussion usually among the members of the order, talk about it. Is it something that we're going to be replaying or does it feel like we've already done this before? Um, how, what's a new spin we could put on it perhaps? Um, uh, mm-hmm. like in the case of Giant Slayer, I think that was the toughest one because we'd already played against the Giants twice and recently. Uh, and and fairly recently, yeah. you know, that was, yeah, yeah, definitely. And so it was a little harder to figure out how we were going to put a spin on it. And then we decided, no, actually, we were the group to do it because we had already done it twice. Mm-hmm. So let's see this love letter to All Against right. the Giants played out. Let's test, us, mm-hmm. test us ourselves against Pathfinder's version. Yeah. Well, plus, yeah. I also remember you guys said you took teamwork feats for Against oh, the yeah. Giants, which is genius. Yeah, those, those are things that no one... <laughs> yeah, that's one thing I've learned over the years, especially... Um, with Paizo, is that they will put out things that people don't necessarily use, but usually they're very secretively very powerful. They are. And, mm-hmm. and like teamwork feats seem, I've never really used them, but they Oh my, they will change, they will change powerful. your game. They'll change the dynamic of your group. And if I can be honest, they definitely bring your, your player, bring your players closer together because it's a commitment. You know what I mean? A lot of people, they, oh, I don't know, I have my feet that's planned out. I don't know if I want to use that. What if I'm not next to you? Well, you know what? How do we play cohesively? Mm-hmm. And then let's make use of these feet. And everyone's got to commit. You know, so the order is all about commitment. That's just another way of making your players commit to the process. And look what happened. It was amazing. Escape route was one of the best things we ever did. We would have died probably in third module if we didn't have it. Um, are you familiar with what it does? Should I explain it? Yeah, explain it. Um, what escape route does is if you are adjacent to another character that has it, when you move, you do not provoke attacks of opportunity. So when you're fighting giants who have a 10-foot reach, anytime you move in there, you'll get, you'll get hammered by their weapons. But if you wait for everyone to, to, get, to, to get together, you can all move in without provoking attacks. So if you're, if you're spending about, what, 60% of the time fighting giants or any other creatures with a large reach, you're gonna be, one person is going to provoke before the other one's going to get in. That's a free attack for the enemy. That was mitigated the entire campaign. 
Did you like that, Adam? That they mitigated <laughs> all your tax of opportunity? I'm a huge fan of teamwork feats. In fact, I usually, you know, tell them, uh, you know, obviously, guys, here we go. Once more, you're going to yep. play on their teamwork feats. So you pick it out. Or mm-hmm. uh, a lot of times, you know, Eric kind of controls all of that, like as far as, uh, you know, what he thinks is best for the group and yep. kind of talks to the guys about it. And then they, they pick one out and, you know. Uh, yeah, the last, last, I, I like to see him play it out. Yeah. It was last time with Shake It Off for a Strange Aeons. And oh, you know, yeah. as you know, Cthulhu, nice. I mean, you're going to see a lot of saving throws. Mm-hmm. That worked the same way. You get a plus one bonus cumulatively, depending on how many people were in the group that had it. So, you know, if, if we travel in a group of four, everyone gets a plus three bonus to all their saves all the time. So when you're, you know, the stuff's jumping out at you and there's fear saves and charm saves, everyone's got plus three across the board for nothing except for one feet sacrifice. It's a small price to pay. And we actually tracked it. We, it was like a hundred and something. I think it was 101 times. Right. Uh, Cause we, he, we, he would go, okay, we make a saving thing. We would go, okay, um, all right, four, two, 21, 23, shake it off. You know, so we would announce the save first and he would go fail. Then we would announce what it was to shake it off. It was success. So we would make a tick mark of how many saves that made successful just by that feat. It was over a hundred. So you're saying. This crazy concept. If you work together as a team, <laughs> as opposed to everyone yeah. fighting for themselves, yep. it actually works out better. Exactly. It does. <laughs> We're not <laughs> knocking concepts. We're not <laughs> knocking approved initiative or dodge or anything like that. But if you can just eh, have a character without that for once and use a teamwork feed, I guarantee you, you're going to see results. So you, Eric, are a player captain. This is mm-hmm. fantastic. I never heard of this concept until you guys brought it up. What is a player captain? Um, it's very similar to how they do it in sports. I mean, it's, it's typically like one of the more experienced players, um, someone that has to have uh, the most firm grasp of the rules. And um, there's also a leadership aspect. I mean, I, you know, it's it's easier for one of the, the other players to assemble the troops, so to speak, and get everyone you know on the same page and let the GM do his own thing instead of letting, letting the GM look at everyone's character sheet and check all their stuff. The GM is super busy, so he doesn't have to do that. So everyone gives me their character sheets, and I look over the stat blocks. I make sure everything's, you know, everything's correct and all their math is right. And they, they come to me for advice or for guidance, you know what I mean? If they have a feat stack they want to try to build or, like, some character concept for role-playing they want to do, if it's within, like, the Iconics backstory, for instance, you know, we'll talk about that, uh, those sorts of things. Um, and plus, you know, you know when, when we're actually playing, I mean, uh, for combat, for, for grid play, um, a lot of people sometimes come to me for advice about what to do. You know, we talk about it in game, but, you know, should I wait? Like, ready your action. Hold on. I'm going to delay for a second. You pull your spell, then I'll attack. You know, those kinds of coordinations. I mean, the player captain usually calls those plays. You know wow. what I mean? So That is a yeah. great idea. It's, it's I mean, fun. Yeah, especially because you guys play live. Like, we play... We play online, so a lot of things are automated hmm. that you don't have to worry about quite as much. Like, and I also the way we play, I'm in charge of loot. I actually mm-hmm. don't allow them to actually. I'm at, <laughs> I'm at a total loot. Like I have an Excel spreadsheet, and I already know what loot's going to drop. Mm-hmm. So all I do is put next to it like who got it. So that way, there's never any fights or issues right. over who has it. So you know, but when I played real life or like you know without the virtual tabletop. There was definitely a lot of roles like, okay, you are in charge of in the initiatives, you are in charge of loot. Like we would give different roles to different player players, tasks. player tasks, yep. to make sure that they are handled. Otherwise, it can't just go into total chaos. Absolutely, right. that's another one of my jobs too, is to delegate that, find out you know who's good at what. You know, we have a guy Dan who's amazing at like note taking. Mm-hmm. You know, he keeps track of all the XP, you know, of all the treasure. So I usually put him on that. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's just less, it, well, when I'm doing something, if I'm cooking for the guys, you know what I mean? We got to have someone running the initiative board because I do that too. So I'll delegate, you know, Eric to do that because, you know, he, he knows the flow of initiative and, you know, he's sitting next to me most times anyway. So, yeah, delegation is another part of uh, the player captain role. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's a great idea. But now you GM, Adam, but you don't have an assistant. Um, no, I don't. I mean, I, I have other members of the order sometimes that, let's say, they can only make it for a day of the marathon, but they're in the area and they want to jump in, then I'll give them one of the NPCs. Um, they'll receive it ahead of time. They'll study it. They'll show up. They'll play for a day. Um, sometimes, you know, join the party. Sometimes go against the party. Yeah, um, you never know. <laughs> so you never really know when someone's <laughs> going to show up. Um, and, and, you know, especially we have one player in the order who's uh, exceptional at killing other PCs. <laughs> and he's going to get his reputation. Yeah, yeah. So I do like to play around them, though, where, where he'll show up and then, you know, his role is to play like, you know, an old man who's, who's helpless or something like that. Yeah, they'll just yeah. freak them all out and they'll, he's they see stab us in the back like, somehow. Watch out. Yeah, exactly. You know, we can't mitigate it, though. Yeah. It's like, no, he might be an ally. Don't, don't turn him away. So, but my thing is, is that 
this has got to be, I mean, it's exhausting enough just to play. If you have to GM, I mean, GMing is so exhausting even when you're, the only thing I have even close to what you do is like when I GM at Gen Con and right. you'll do like 12 hours or 15, mm. 16 hours and you are just fried at the end of that. And mm -hmm. you're doing it for four days in a row yeah. with immersion, with miniatures, with guys that are hardcore. Yeah. So it's not like, you know, newbies that you can just sort of make up rules as you go along. So how the hell do you manage to stay awake and alive for four days? Uh, should we plug <laughs> that's in That's right a great here? question. <laughs> should we grab a can of Monster from the fridge? Uh, okay. Too bad we're not on video. Uh, yeah, you know, caffeine is important. <laughs> caffeine is important, but you also don't want to overdo it because mm -hmm. You do have to plan for four days. I mean, even if you go hard two days in a row, you right. still, you know, that's halfway through a marathon. So right. um, that's a good question. I, I don't know. You know, I figure one of these years I'll start to fade and then that'll, that'll change the order and we'll kind of have to redirect. But um, for right now, I, I just, I'm inspired by the contribution of our members. I mean, the different things that they'll put in and, and how much effort they'll go through to, to help make this happen. It's amazing how much they're doing to make it easier in any way they can for me. Like you're talking about, it is exhausting. So, you know, if I can't leave the screen to go do something, they're going to bring me food. They're going to bring me, you know, they're always asking me, Adam, what do you need? What, you know, can I do something? Can I, I'll say sometimes you guys are really just, you know, I got to get this thing done. Or actually sometimes it might be, I have to mail something or I have to can you pick <laughs> something up on the way to the game today. Can you, you know, they're, it's that simple. I mean, sometimes the GM just needs you to take care of something that, you know, he or she needs 20 minutes for, and if you do it, that saves them 20 minutes. And that's right. That's more prep. That that's more game. Up. That's everything. 20 yeah, so, here, 20 there. Um, they take good care of me, and um, you yeah, know, we just, like I said, I'm, I'm always in awe of how much effort they're putting in, and I just try to match it, and that's the order. So. Yeah, so, I, I have to say that we we feel you know the same way, but the other way around, he puts so much effort into what he does, it almost like motivates us to you know if, if we slack, that's almost disrespectful to the effort that he's putting in, so we don't let ourselves do that. You know what I mean? So one thing I noticed, which I also drew me to you guys, is that you only do published adventures, mm -hmm. it looks like. And I myself only do published adventures. So I only like to jam published adventures basically because I feel like I can never really come up with anything as good as what a lot of these published adventures do. Especially now when you have people whose literal jobs are to make adventures full time. Mm. This is all they do. They're probably better at it than I am. So why waste my time trying to come up with something <laughs> because theirs is going to be better. It's just, I get a lot of I'd say not poo-pooing, but I'd get a lot of, oh, you don't come up with your own stuff. You, don't you want to write your own things? Don't you want to run your own things? And the funny thing is the answer is for me is always no, not really. I'm way more interested in seeing what other people write and come up with. And you are the only other person I've ever met who seems to have the exact same philosophy that I do, that you just want to almost just see what other people do and run with it and run it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I love to compare them too over the years and uh, different styles of authorship and dungeon design, you know, adventure design, just uh, you get to know some of the authors who, who hands out the heavy loot, you know, who's <laughs> always got the deadly uh, yeah. NPC levels added on to, you know, some kind of already powerful monster who t tends to uh, rely heavily on traps, um, you know, just, yeah, it's interesting. I think that, uh, I don't know, I just, I've always felt the same way, kind of just spent my life trying to play published adventures and constantly comparing them to each other and trying to grow from that. Yeah. So I'm looking here. So you've played 141 published adventures since 1987. <laughs> I knew this number yeah. was going to go. <laughs> yes. How is this accurate? Yes. How do you oh, know? <laughs> I used to hide from the number, Steve. <laughs> uh, why, why hide uh, from it? It's, well, I mean, if you really figure it out, if you think, Okay, 141, 30 years. Um, yeah, it's a lot of play. It's a lot um, of playing. Yeah, well, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not that it's, bad. Uh, but, you know, if you love the game, I mean, this is this is what we do. And, um, you know, some of them have been repeated. So I, I think uh, A1, mm -hmm. the Slade Pits of the Undercity, yes. we played plenty of times. The Tomb of Horrors, uh, three sure. times, I think. Um, oh, you have Tomb of Horrors in here four to oh, five geez, times. Five? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> All right, so it's oh, <laughs> a good adventure. What happens when you, when you play to me? Um, I'm trying to think, yeah, a few others in there. We've done. I, I think it was once you hit three five that we started to just do one run through, and that was all you got. Right. Um, and Except then for Vault, Vault of the Dragon, Dragon. Yep. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, that would love that adventure. Um, we had a good time with it, and 
ran it twice. So but, of all these, what's your favorite one? Oh, oh wow. wow. That's, oh, that's a hard one. That's a question oh, I know, have right there. Or, uh, okay, um, what, what was some of your more favored ones? Some of my more favorite ones. Um, Heart of Nightfang Spire. Uh, I like that one. Uh, it was deadly. Just sometimes I, I wonder if it's simply our playthrough as well. You know, you think about the party you happen to have at the time um, or the stories that came out of it. Um, but that was one of them. Uh, definitely Tomb of Horrors, I mean, without a doubt. I think Tomb of the Lizard King, I really liked yeah. that too. Um, and Keep on Borderlands. Keep on, well, it's kind of a classic oh. uh, grinder, though. Oh, oh my man. God. We, we, um, yeah, I think. How many PCs were to lost back. in that? In lost that. Caverns? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Lost Caverns. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, it was a great adventure. And you have uh, some really good ones. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you White Plume Mountain. Oh, you don't have S3 in here, though. You don't have Barrier Peaks. Right. Right. Yeah, actually, we never did. I own it, and have, I yeah, love the guys know about peaks. it. You know, yep. it's, that's got a great arrow. Yeah, hasn't got to it yet. And, oh, you know, that's a good one. Yeah, Maybe it's we a whole sci-fi. Yeah, that was definitely an interesting move. It was Gygax, too, actually. So mm -hmm. um, that's going to have to be, that's on the docket. Mm -hmm. for sure. So that's a hard um, one, too. Yeah. Actually, there was a conversion for that. There was a 3-5 yeah. conversion that was yeah. um, made. But, yeah, just a lot of the classics. I've spent a lot of time... Deciding, all right, you know, you only have so many years to play, and which ones do you want to kind of frontline? You can't play everything that's out there. You There's just can't. There's simply too much material that's been published. So you have to sit down with your players or decide, you know, in whatever method you use, how do you want to structure the years that you have going forward as a campaign or as so a So you literally are planning the rest of your life around playing adventures. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> you put it that way, but I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily accurate, um, but... I guess. Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we frequently have these talks yeah. in the order. Uh, it's one of our favorite things to do is actually sit around and talk about what we have played. And, campfire stories. And what we, yeah, you know, the campfire stories, or what, especially at the end of a marathon. That's that's a really fun time when we're done. We're all packing up and we're talking about, you know, what next year, next project, or where did this module fit in? Where did this weekend fit in? You know, when we play, it's every marathon has a different identity. Everyone has a different feeling. Trapped in that asylum in uh, in Search of Sanity uh, for Shane Jayons, we were just left feeling, you know, it was, it was, it was stressful. It was a relief yeah, to God. be finished in and we out were of free. It was incredible. It was really You're great, trapped in one place the entire time. You're like, um, finally, I'm outside. And nothing's trying to um, kill me right now. This is great. Getting beat on by giants for a weekend, and then mm -hmm. come Monday morning, you know, you're all reflecting on it and talking about where this fit in in the course of your career as an adventurer and how this module compared to others. And things so, like who that. was in the original? Because obviously, you guys started in '87. So, who was like quote the original, uh, the the core four or the original? Oh, wow, the core four. Uh, way back five. in the day, I mm -hmm. want to say '87. It was in Mom's living room, <laughs> and uh, on uh, yeah, gosh, any given afternoon. And that would have been myself GMing, uh, Chris Kelly. Chris, Chris was a friend of mine actually growing up, uh, went to school together and then. And he's still in the water uh, now. He is actually still, he played with us last. Yeah, the Rune Lords. Uh, he's like about a once a year. Yeah. Uh, yeah he'll drop in twice a year. Yeah, cameo here and there. Uh, he played with us in the fall. Uh, and Patrick Wilkins, uh, Brad Mallon, which is kind of where the story of the Amber Die came from. Uh, but he was, they were all kids from the block, a lot of them. You know, mm -hmm. that was the eighties and you, you, you actually yeah, had a block. You just kind of had like a, right. you've done a block. Everybody, yeah. you, you played, rode bikes. You, everybody in you the had a bus and... stop instead of stopping at every <laughs> yeah. house on yeah. the way down a single lane. That's street. what I tell people because I mean I grew up in the '80s as well, and every everything you see on um, on uh, Stranger Things, mm -hmm. pretty accurate. I used to ride yeah. my bike everywhere. I rode yep. my bike to mm -hmm. school. We used to hang out and play video games and play D and D. Like and before you know it, your parents would be yelling at you. You've been playing for twelve hours. I remember one <laughs> night we were playing. Tomb of Horrors, and I was playing till like four in the morning, mm -hmm. and you know, I, 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 it's just crazy stuff, crazy stories. Slamming miniatures yeah. on the table, oh, yeah. screaming at the top of your lungs, yeah. waking up your siblings, riding yeah. bikes without helmets. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. No <laughs> I, 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 saw, I have a huge scar on my head from when I smashed my head and woke up in the hospital once. So yeah, <laughs> before the days of helmets, yeah. uh, it was fun. We're still here somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A couple oh, of little nicks along the way. Yeah. But you guys, I mean, how did you manage to, like, just keep it up? Like, with me, you know, I have a similar background. Like, we were playing all the time. And then, for me, second edition came out in college. 
But then we kind of had a break because, uh, and I was telling you this earlier, like Magic the Gathering came out and that sort of took our, <laughs> took all of our time and effort. And we were playing since Alpha. So we were going to tournaments every week and we we're really into it. And we we're playing that for many, many years competitively. And in New York City, there was a huge Magic the Gathering scene. It's a mm -hmm. really, really big scene. So we were always playing Magic. And then Magic kind of calmed down. Then we drifted back into 3.5 and have been here ever since. What was your story? Like, did you just keep playing straight through and never stopped? Or? Uh, it included a heavy magic phase. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, dabbled in Pro Tour qualifiers, and I was the state champion um, where I went to school in Montana. And, you know, so, yeah, we definitely had kind of that same experience. We played less in those years when we were playing a lot of magic, but the marathon format that we had allowed us to hold the group together. And we, people could travel. If you're only playing every few months... And people are making some large sacrifice, say, to come and play. They're getting more out of it and they're willing to travel further distance or put more effort out. And I think it allows groups to, I rec definitely recommend the format to anybody who hasn't tried it, but it allows groups to have a larger player base that's spread across uh, even other countries. I mean, mm -hmm. if someone, it's amazing what people will yeah. go through if they know they're going to be playing for four days. Because what you're going to get in four days is often what most players might get in a year. And so they're definitely willing to make that journey. I mean, you got to figure every Friday night they're packing up their stuff and traveling to your house for four hours. They'd love to do it and just travel one time, set up in the beginning, play four days straight, mm -hmm. break down at the end. It's incredibly efficient play. And that allowed us to hold the group together. So wait, you have 15 members of the order right now. Um, so you only have... You so have UGM, and then there's four players. So it's only really five at a time who play um, uh -huh. per marathon. Each has we had well, eight we, of us there? We had eight in the beach. Yeah, we had a lot. Yeah, we had a lot of NPTs. Yeah, we, okay, okay. we had ten cycling mm -hmm. the whole weekend. Right. Uh, everybody wanted it on the beach house. That was. That okay. was <laughs> I was going to ask, like, yeah. how does that work? Because it's like, okay, well, if you have 15 people and only, and you're always playing because you're the GM. So, right. <laughs> how does how do the other 14 decide who's going to play and who's not going to play? Or... Usually, it's pretty easy with the as far as the core four goes. Um, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's, can, who can do it? Who's got the ability yeah. to play? six times in the next year for a marathon. I mean, that's right. a lot. It's a lot of, and people who will go in on one of those, if you do a project, you're unlikely to be in the next project. I mean, it does a significant, oh, uh, you got to take days of, off. I mean, you, you get them. two or three weeks of personal. You know, I mean, this is serious. You <laughs> got to, you got to <laughs> yeah. take off work. You got to ignore yeah. the kids and the yeah. wife. And, oh yeah. yeah no, you, you this, gotta, you this gotta, is Pathfinder we're talking about. You got to spend your three yeah. day weekends, your government holidays properly, take another day off, make that a four day or, and then bam, there's your marathon. You got to be able to do that yeah. if you can't do that especially if you got family and kids it's hard you know it's hard to be able to commit something to that you know not have any family time so it's yeah. rougher for the you know some of the people that that have like children they can't yeah. do the four days which is totally understandable they should the like, children should absolutely be their priority but so you know, you're, some, you're the npcs yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly the family exactly. guys are the npcs that's right that's the right npcs and right. they're fine with it they get to, uh, they, get, they yeah. still get to play so how did you find people or how do you continuously find people or what are you looking for people is there a test like how does this work um, you want to talk about the test? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there, there is a, uh, there is a rules questionnaire, so to speak, that, uh, that I designed just, just to find out, you know, someone's basic ability and proficiency in the rules in the game in general. Um, there's, there's that, but there's also, you know, there's also like a friendship level, you know what I mean? We'll go to, we'll go to conventions and we'll, we'll meet some people and, and regardless of how they, how they play, that can always be, you know, coached later if they if they're cool people and they'll be getting along and you know just like us you know we have similar backgrounds the same passions i mean that's more important you know we sit a good person down at the table the rules can be hashed out later you yeah know what i mean no there's definitely a compatibility but, uh, factor yeah yeah, yeah that's... but we just look for people that are dedicated and love the game as much as we do and take it seriously and are willing to make sacrifices to to do it in the way that we do it are you thinking of ever having a second order in the sense that right now adam's not you're the only one that gms would you ever have like a second GM that's doing another adventure or even a parallel adventure somewhere else in the country? Or is it right now only one adventure at a time? Um, it's kind of always just been one adventure. Yeah. I mean, I think that's just who we are. And, I mean, that's, um, that's, you know, we, the, the Amber die is his die. Only he rolls the die. There's only one Amber die, <laughs> so, so we can only have one adventure at a time, no, no, right? It's, one Amber it, die. Yeah. The Amber <laughs> die has earned its name for a reason, and that's why he, you know, one of the reasons why he's a GM. He's, he's the best of all of us. I mean, like, he's the best GM that we have. So why wouldn't we, you know, play under him? 
You know what I mean? So let's hear. I'm looking at the amber die, and I got to roll it. And it's fun. It's definitely one of those super nice old school dies. It's definitely a little worn. It has the colors half stripped off the numbers, which is great. So how did? And it's a beautiful amber. I've never seen a die quite like this. It actually is. It's a, definitely one of those old school dice that you just don't see anymore. So what is the story of the amber die? Story of the amber die. Let's see. Okay, so the year is 1987. And the first time it did what it does, which is chain 20s back to back, I wasn't the one rolling it. And another player who was on the block, Brad, he was over and he needed some dice. So he had borrowed this die apparently from me. The crazy part of the story is I was trying to get him to take it home. I was like, no, it's yours. He was saying, no, I got it out of your bag. I don't remember buying it. And this was the day, you know, in the 80s, you went to the the hobby shop. There was a, a little... You know, cube Short of 20 points. siders, you pull it out, you roll it a bunch of times till they're annoyed at you, and then you buy one, right? <laughs> so at some point, I bought this die, and it was in my bag, and, and he was, you know, convinced that's where he got it from. I definitely said, pick some out. So he had rolled it, and four 20s back-to-back came out. The group was going nuts. I mean, I remember it was actually a backstab. Oh, my um, God. So we were, Sorry. yeah, the place was roaring, and I just, at the end of the night, was thinking, like, wow, this is incredible. I guess it is my die. And so for a while we were calling it Brad's die, even though it was mine, because he was the only one who could produce that four twenties um, and then in a row, and then or had done it once, I guess. But then it started to happen more and more, and over the years we started to record the different times that it happened, and it's unbelievable. And how to play down I mean, the story, to change yeah, games. Yeah, it's you know, especially when Instant Kill came in. That's when oh. it really started to become. That's when I think the order started to establish itself, and we started to revere the die on some, on some mm-hmm. kind of like whole other level because you could put down any player with this it could be an orc and it would just be 20 20 20 done it, it didn't matter what ac they had yep. and i did it well i did it in the fall uh somebody had a 44 ac i had right. no chance i was playing right. it was in um operation nazi smasher we were doing a um, promo uh charity event and right. I, I could right, not bring this character down and i was just rolling with a bunch of, you know, scrub guys, whatever, that couldn't seem to hit, and 2020 killed a PC, you know, yep. it's just, so. A fresh one, unwounded. <laughs> yeah, it's, got, it's just uh, kind of a magical die like that, you know, and it just has done it so consistently, and I, I swore that I did not buy this die, I don't know where it came from, but everyone said, no, it was in your bag, Brad took it out of your bag, and he rolled those 420s, and ever since then, it's been, it's been with me, and. So there, are there any secondary dice that are also infamous, or is this it? This is the only one. Uh, I have some others that I really love and rely on for certain. Yeah, I'm, th- I'm sure we all have these stories. I think every group kind of has, you know, and you go to conventions and stand any line, you'll hear a story about oh, yeah. dice. But um, So, yeah, there are several others. Um, there's one when I was a player, which is very rare, uh, that I was using. It's a white, solid white die that, um, you know, love and... Just doesn't let me down. So, yeah, I have. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone does. I have um, what I call the purple dye of death mm. because <laughs> it's like this nice purple. It's just a normal dye that I got at Gen Con maybe like 15 years ago. But man, that thing is good at killing people. <laughs> it sounds similar. It's like, and it only works for me. Mm-hmm. It's like you give it to other people, it doesn't seem to work. But right. when I roll it, it definitely seems to knock uh, out player characters quite well. I've lost many characters to that dye over my career. <laughs> I, I bear no resentment, I swear to you. It's just, and that's. Also, all the players, it's not just about the GM. I mean, the players also revere the die because we've all seen it do things so many times. We get new players and, oh, they'll, they'll be skeptical and all of a sudden something will happen. And I'm like, okay, I believe it. Don't no disrespect. I'm yeah. sorry. They apologize to the die. I think yeah, that's I mean, one of the most <laughs> enjoyable parts is, yeah. is watching new people come in yeah. and see it do what it's right. supposed to do. See and, the know. power of the die. Especially when we started doing these projects for Paizo and it was. I was nervous that it wasn't going to perform. Right. Because, you know, here it was like, I was going to I'm part of the spotlight here, you know, can it, can it perform under the lights? Is it going to react differently with the pressure, you know? And, and sure enough, you oh, man, it was in on module fire one. in Giant Slayer. Mm-hmm. Was, yeah, I felt bad at times. But, you know, you can't, but, no, you can never do that. Well, the die didn't good. feel bad. No, the die did not. You know, oh, you no. have to just... You know, hey, you know, appreciate every moment that it but, gives you. But you, uh, but magic. you won't balance it, right? You, you're tempting, um, but not. We've talked about it. You know, it doesn't. Here's the thing. I think one of the reasons why people in the group don't really care as much about that. It rolls plenty of ones. In right. fact, I mean, it rolls a lot. Of, it rolls a lot of low numbers here and there. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just really not. It's the chaining effect. I think that's so strange about it. And um, it's great when he does it when he's on our side. 
It's, it's not that it yeah. consistently rolls high or that it consistently rolls uh, even 20s, though. It's not even like just it's, it's the two in a row, three in a row. That's mm-hmm. the strangest part about it. For me, as a player, um, it's like but, I was saying before, it's the moments it chooses to do that. They're choice moments. I mean, like, you know, like when you really need something to happen, I mean, bring that die out. It'll happen. You know what I mean? You know those times as GM when you've played enough of the game and you really want to hit this player or you've got this monster that you, has an ability and you really want this to fire off for the story and it's not going to be a 19 or an 18 that'll do it for you. You already run the numbers in your head or the battle's gone on long enough to know that it's going to have to be a 20. And so mm-hmm. that's when you go to the Amber Dine. I think that's probably skewing some of the numbers and maybe I go to it more often or something in those situations. I don't, I don't know, but I mean, it's the multiple 20s that definitely, those, mm-hmm. those back-to-back ones... Um, you know, or three, four in a row, just unbelievable. The whole room is silent sometimes, when it, when it, just because you're just happy to all. be there for that. Yeah. yeah. So why? I mean, I know why I do adventure paths. I mean, or I'll tell you why. I mean, we do adventure paths because we're similar. Our group is very similar to yours. We've been playing forever. We've seen it all. We've been playing since the seventies. You know, there's really you know half the modules in here we've either played or read or seen, and you know. We like the concept of a story. We like the concept that you have a character. You know, before, you know, the adventure paths, you had just, like, individual adventures that were just sort of randomly knitted together, and you just sort of figured it out as you went along. But here, it's like a cohesive story that you can tell from beginning to end, and they usually, you know, do a pretty good job of it. And you can also see your characters grow and evolve. So, like, we love it. Like, we... We love that whole concept, and it also brings us together. Like, you know, we play every week because it's an adventure path. If it was something like a module, you might play the module for a few times and then dissipate and might not play for another couple of weeks or months Mm -hmm. because there's no incentive to play again. But here, you always have an incentive constantly to play. So what drew, drew you guys like to adventure paths as opposed to, because there's plenty of modules out there and Paizo still, mm-hmm. you know, had a ton of modules that they, you could have played any of those. True. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I mean, Adam had been doing the, the uh, concept of adventure paths you know, before we even right. figured out about Pathfinder. I mean, he would take these classic, you know, AD&D modules and would, would put them, you know, you know in, a, in a sort of location that made sense for all of them, arrange them by levels and, you know, with themes and stuff like that, then do the full-on conversion of 3.5, and we would just play those as a campaign. So he had been doing these, these things already, and all of a sudden, oh, my God, they did it for you? This is great. Let's just try that. And that's how we got into Pathfinder, you know, for the most part. Yeah. And a lot of it just kind of fell into our laps with mm-hmm. um, the Emerald Spire project was what initially kind of connected us to Paizo. And then we came up with the idea, just pitched it out like, hey, you know, what if we played one of these pads and put it on the blog and we'll kind of track the data and fo- turn it into like kind of a whole story people can follow. And um, that was our first path. That was Giant Slayer. So, mm-hmm. yeah, we just sort of got into it in an unexpected way there. I mean, we were just playing yeah. individual modules back to back, trying to fit in where the Tomb of Horrors would go in a campaign. Mm-hmm. Or maybe yeah. it would be a campaign with several tombs, you know, that you put back to back. And, and so um, now that we're kind of hooked on these APs, <laughs> you know, yeah. who knows where it will lead us. But Yeah, it was funny. I was talking to you earlier because of all the adventure paths, and I'm going to go out on a limb here, I, I've, I've played them all or I've seen them all and I've read them all, but I haven't played them all, but I've played a lot of them. I played about as many as you guys have. I think a little bit more. And the best one by far, I'd say this over and over, is Age of Worms. And Age of Worms was only the second venture path ever made. It was done for Dungeon Magazine. But it is every single adventure is written by, you know, the best of the best. It's, uh, you know, Eric Mona and and um, you know, Jason Bullman and Richard Pett and, you know, everyone who's ever been someone in D&D world wrote it. Plus, without giving anything away, which is hard to do, they, they basically took every single crazy concept from Dungeons & Dragons that you can think of and said, you know what, we're going to put it in this adventure path. You name it. You meet... Tenzer, you go to the free city of Greyhawk, you fight dragons, you fight um, mind flayers, you, you know, like every single iconic monster you've ever wanted to fight, they're in here. 
and displacer beasts. Oh, they're in here. It's like, you just gelatinous cubes? Sure. Like, every single thing. And, like, the most crazy pieces of magic. Oh, the rod of seven parts? Sure enough. Yep, here it is. Like, <laughs> you name it, it's in this adventure path. And every module is like that. The only downside is it is 12 modules. <laughs> and it does take you to about level 21, 22. But there is a ton of Pathfinder conversions for this because mm. it's that good. So you need to read it at the minimum. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like, and uh, no, we, you know, as we had chatted about it a little bit here and there, I, I definitely, uh, yeah, this this sounds like it might have, might be on the docket closer mm -hmm. up than we think. Um, you know, especially I'm I'm intrigued about the level twenty one, twenty two, and the higher levels. Yeah, That's, we haven't done Mythic yet. That is something. Try. Yeah, Mythic has been something we've been talking about, and also just the. Just the lack of, you know, if you look at all the published material ever created out there, there's just a small percentage, and it makes sense why, but there's a small percentage that's for higher level characters pushing 20th. Um, even when you go back to first edition, it was just, it makes sense to create lower level adventures if you're from a marketing perspective, but, um, you know, I think it was something like 15% of all groups actually reached part six of an AP. Hmm. Um, so you got to figure if you're at what you know 17th 18th level i mean right. how many adventures are really out there for that so i would love to go to 22nd <laughs> yeah sounds like age of worms is the way to do it yeah and you actually get up to i mean there's 12 modules i'm going off memory here i think module 7 you get up to like level 15 i mean it mm. slows down but there's a good like at least half if not one third wow. of it is super high level and unlike most high level adventures it actually really works well because again they are they're not fooling around like it's like oh okay you're level 16 and 17 well have fun fighting the giants and the dragons attacking you simultaneously i know that was a little bit of dragon slayer <laughs> but you know mm -hmm. that's in here you know they mm -hmm. have a lot of that of these are big monsters and you're fighting big creatures that can easily kill you you know these are not knockover fights and mm. it and they're like oh you think that's good well then you're going to go another dimension and fight like demigods like it just keeps ramping up like they just they pile it on it's sounds it's, great yeah <laughs> it's a good adventure path yeah it sounds like a great uh, one to 20 and then maybe a couple of mythic levels in there to get to yeah. 22 and Oh, I'm going to be the yeah, perfect character, yeah, no, aren't I? Think I? This, is, uh, oh, yeah. this is interesting, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. I know you like Tiamat, and there's Tiamat in there as well. All right, well, <laughs> you, you may have sold me here. Yeah, that's at least, me well, that's what I've always I wanted to fight Tiamat. I know. Well, at least read the first one, because the first one, and I had Eric Mona on the show a couple of months ago. He wrote the first adventure. Um, a lot of people believe it's one of the greatest introductory adventures ever written. It's always in the top lists. It's my number. It's my favorite Low level adventure ever written is the first one in um, in uh, the Age of Worms, and at the minimum read it, and I think you'll be uh, amazed. Like I read it, and it hooked me, and it hooked our group. That was the first adventure we played when we went into three point five, and it managed to hook us to continue mm. to play now because we were like stunned how good it was. Interesting. So, yeah, it's um it's fascinating because Eric tells the story better than me, but. At the time, they knew that Dungeon was probably going to be canceled or there was some issue. And they also said, oh, just go crazy. So they did. You know, like, <laughs> and these are people who love D&D. &D. And, you know, it does take place, right. obviously. It's 3.5. It's the D&D &D world. So, but, you know, you grew up with D&D. &D, like, it sure. doesn't have to all be Pathfinder. So you can convert right. this all, you know, to, mm -hmm. you know, like play D&D &D and, you know, play with um, the legendary, you know, Wizards of Greyhawk and... Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. I'd love to go back to Greyhawk. Actually, it's been it's been a, a while. Long time. Yeah, it's been since I was a teenager for me. Thirty years. <laughs> so yeah, it's been it's been a while. We were we were initially there, and then kind of did a little sit with Dark Sun there, yeah. and then Ravenloft, and um, yeah. So I would I'd love to go back. So don't forget, next week we will have part two of our interview with Order of the Amber Die. But with that, let's get right to the big show, the PaizoCon Contest. For those of you new, we are going to be giving out a free trip to PaizoCon. That's right. You're going to get free airfare. You're going to get a free hotel room. You're going to get a free badge. And you will get a free banquet ticket. And also, you will get a chance to perhaps play the Pathfinder version 2 
with ourselves and perhaps a Paizo dev. That one is still underway, but it should happen. So what do you need to do? Very simple. First of all, you need to be over 18. You need to live in the continuous United States, basically anywhere except Alaska or Hawaii. And you need to answer all the questions. There has been a question that has been asked on episode 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and now 30. If you answer all those questions right, and you submit your questionnaire, and if you are drawn, then you win. There you go. We will have the drawing in two weeks. So on episode number, I guess, 32, then I will announce the winner. So in two weeks. So get to it, those of you who have not listened to those last few episodes. First of all, let's say what this week's question is. The last question is, how many days of protection did Mo, Tuttle, Hiroji, and Rusty have in their upcoming jungle adventure with their armor? There is a certain number of days each of them has. It's dependent upon their armor level. And I basically said to them how many days they each have. So just tell me what that answer is. So how do you enter? Simple. Just go to PaizoCon. So how do you enter? It's simple. You just go to PaizoCon.RollForCombat.com. Fill out the questionnaire. Submit it. And you will be entered. There are rules and conditions on the site if you wish to check those out. There's only one entry per person, and if you are randomly selected, you have one week to claim your prize and get all the information together so that you can go. Also, you need to be on the Roll for Combat Discord. It is a requirement. To do that, you can just go to discord.rollforcombat.com. Everyone there is super friendly. We play Starfinder games. You can see images from the show and lots of other fun things. So once again, there is no GM tip this week, but we still have our contest. That's right, all you need to do is submit a review on iTunes or Stitcher or Facebook. Write us here at rollforcombat.com. You can just use the form on the website, or you can write us at contest at rollforcombat.com. That all works, and you're automatically entered. And if we call out your name, you win a $100 Amazon gift card. That's it. That's all you need to do. Just review us. So this week's winner is GM Horologist. So GM Horologist did a review on iTunes. Just contact me and you will get your prize. So just a few quick show notes. Don't forget we have a new podcast every Tuesday. Please subscribe to us on iTunes and Android. Also, make sure you check out Jason's Talking Combat column every Thursday morning. He does a great review of each episode. He also goes into a lot of tips and tricks and just his general thoughts about role-playing in general. It's fantastic. And you could check that out on the website, RollForCombat.com. Also, as I said before, make sure you check out our Discord to play some Starfinder and check out images from every episode in the Roll for Combat episode images channel. You can follow us at discord.rollforcombat.com. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We also have a Reddit channel if you want to check that out. And we have a Patreon where we have cool prizes and we are going to be releasing our Starfinder Society podcast early. If you are a member of our Patreon, you will get it right now. It's not coming out for another week or two on the show and you can listen to the episode early. And don't forget to check out the website. We also have things like we just reviewed the Starfinder Packworlds book. So if you want to check out a review of the book, check out it on the website. And also, of course, we have Talking Combat every week. And we have some fun blog posts. Also, check out our free Loot Box of Wonder on Drive-Thru RPG. We made a free Loot Box of Wonder that anyone can use in their Starfinder game that was written by Thirsty Hillman himself. Sort of like a deck of many things for Starfinder. And don't forget our brand new Starfinder Society podcast will be starting shortly. If you subscribe to our podcast or follow us on Twitter or Facebook, you'll be notified as soon as it's posted. As I said before, it should be within a week or two. It's going to have the same people that are on the show now, plus Rob Tremarco and Jason Keeley from Paizo. We have brand new characters, everyone starting at level one, 
and I'm going to be running an adventure that is not one of the starter adventures. That's right, everyone thinks everyone wants us to do Adventure 1-1 1 or 1-0, and we said, nah, we're going to jump right in the deep end and do something crazy. We're going to do one of the nutty adventures. So, yeah, you got that to look forward to. And with that, I'll see you all next week. See ya. You've been listening to Roll for Combat, a Starfinder actual play podcast. If you have a question or comment for the show, please visit us at RollForCombat.com or drop us a line at contact at RollForCombat.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Discord, and other social media platforms. been listening to roll for combat until next week always remember tuttle's motto i'm surrounded by morons